It's the morning of January 12th, 1979, and Sorella Wofford was getting ready to babysit her neighbor's two little boys. She would often babysit for her upstairs neighbor, Yvonne Cisneros, as well as other residents in the building who had children. However, on this particular morning, Yvonne was late to drop off her two boys, Carlos, who was four, and Benjamin, who was two, at Sorella's apartment. After a bit, Sorella started to wonder where they were. She decided to go upstairs and knock on the family's door. She was gonna ask Yvonne if she still needed help with the boys for the day, but there was no answer. Welcome or welcome back. I'm Cassie and this is A Wicked World. So the reason I had heard about this particular crime is because my mother-in-law was actually very good friends with the victim and the victim's family. And as I started doing my research, I began to realize that it is not only a very sad case, but it is very, very frustrating. And it's technically listed as an unsolved case. Let me know what you think by the end of the video. This is the story of Yvonne, Benjamin, and Carlos Cisneros. Yvonne Cisneros, born Yvonne Romero on November 21st, 1957, was from Pueblo, Colorado. She had graduated from Pueblo Central High School. Then, when she was 16 years old, she married the love of her life, Benjamin Cisneros, on March 2nd, 1974. Ben Cisneros was in the military, and he was currently stationed at Fort Carson. The couple ended up having their first child together, Carlos, on July 17th, 1974. He was also born in Pueblo, Colorado. Then on August 7th, 1976, the couple had their second son, Benjamin Jr., and he was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. The family lived at the Fountain Bleu apartment complex in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The couple had been trying to have a third child, and Yvonne had just recently found out that she was pregnant. They were so excited. Yvonne was a very happy and loving person, and one of the things that she loved to do the most was hang out with her friends and laugh for hours on end. Of course, she also loved to spend time with her husband and her adorable little boys. Yvonne had a job, too. She was also a waitress at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. Carlos and Benjamin were typical little boys who were active and loud, but very sweet. They were both said to have gentle souls, and they loved playing with their neighbor's 10-month-old son, Adonis. They also liked playing music and dancing to it. The two were very kind-hearted young boys, and it's also said that they would always kiss their babysitter goodbye at the end of the day. So on the morning of January 12th, 1979, Yvonne's downstairs neighbor, Sorella, was wondering where her and the boys were. They were usually on time. Sorella had already knocked at the door a few times and nobody had come to answer, but she heard a faint banging noise going on in the apartment, but nobody sounded in distress. So she figured that maybe the couple was just having some sort of disagreement and she didn't want to get involved. So she went back down to her apartment figuring that she would hear from Yvonne later in the day. But then, just a few hours later, Sorella heard sirens, and then she saw police walking towards Yvonne's apartment. Apparently, Benjamin Sr. had come home to find the bloodied bodies of his wife and two boys. 22-year-old Yvonne Cisneros and her boys Benjamin and Carlos had been viciously attacked and stabbed in their home. Yvonne was found lying in the bathtub in very shallow, bloody water. And the boys' bodies were each in separate bedrooms on separate beds. They had been badly beaten and stabbed. The three had been killed sometime between 5 a.m. when Benjamin Cisneros went into work and when he returned home from his shift as an air traffic controller around 12.15. There were no signs of a break-in, robbery, or a fight. There was, however, a potted plant that was knocked over at the scene. The police also found a pen that had blood on it. 
And along with the blood, it had some sort of white dried substance that they were unsure of what it was. It looked like it might be paint. Police could not make immediate individual identification of the boys. One had been laying on his back, the other on his side, and they were covered in so much blood that at first they couldn't tell who was who. Yvonne was only partially clothed and her husband had laid a blanket over her when he found her body because he did not want anyone else to see her the way that he had found her. The detectives believed that the family had been killed elsewhere in the apartment and then moved to the areas that they were found after. Autopsies were done of the mother and her sons. Yvonne's autopsy indicated that she had been essayed by a mop handle. She was also stabbed 60 times in the upper chest and abdomen. She was then strangled. Carlos, the older boy, was struck six times in the head with a barbell. He had died of multiple skull fractures. He also had been stabbed 19 times post-mortem. Benjamin Jr. died from 22 stab wounds in his upper chest, and he was then gagged with a bunch of tissues. It looked like Yvonne had been killed first and then the boys because they had witnessed the crime that was committed against their mother. And the assailant knew that they could possibly identify him, so they had to go. Some of their stab wounds had been inflicted with a knife and others were inflicted with an instrument that looked to be a screwdriver. Police determined that the crime happened sometime between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. on January 12th. Since Yvonne's husband, Benjamin, had been the one to find his family like this, he was brought in first for questioning. Since there was no signs of forced entry, he was at first the police's main suspect. Authorities, however, didn't find anything suspicious in Benjamin and Yvonne's relationship. They also asked Benjamin where he had been that morning. He told them that he had been at work on the military base. He said he had only returned home at 12.15 that day because after calling Yvonne earlier and her not picking up, he had become very worried and went back to the house to check on her and the boys. The army was able to back up this alibi. The Cisneros family had moved into the two-bedroom apartment in the Fontainebleau complex in May of 1978. About half the apartments in the complex were vacant, which left the Cisneros family with very few neighbors. None of the neighbors that police contacted had heard any noises from their apartment. Then a witness came forward. It was actually a neighbor who lived down the hall from the Cisneros family. He told detectives that he had seen a maintenance man entering Benjamin and Yvonne's apartment the morning of the attacks, around 10 a.m., he said. The witness said the man was about six feet tall, about 170 pounds, with a short afro. He said the man had been wearing a plaid shirt and tan pants. When police spoke to the building's maintenance manager, they found out that this description matched one of their maintenance men. This maintenance man's name was James Joseph Perry. James lived with his common-law wife, Victoria Martinez, and their multiple children in Colorado Springs. He had moved to Colorado Springs shortly after he had been paroled from a New York penitentiary in 1976. In 1962, in Fiskill, New York, he had actually been convicted of first-degree manslaughter. James, who had been 17 at the time, along with his friend, Edward Clifton Davis, had broken into an apartment. Sound familiar? The two surprised the tenant and then proceeded to beat him to death with an iron pipe. I'm not sure how they got off with just manslaughter on that one, because that sure does not sound like manslaughter to me. James had been sentenced to 10 to 20 years in a maximum security prison. During his incarceration, he actually had to be moved to different penitentiaries within New York because of his behavioral issues. He had only served eight years of his sentence when he was first paroled in 1970. A year later, he was sent back to prison though because of parole violations. He stayed in prison for another year and was paroled again in 1972. Two years after that release, he was convicted of new crimes and sent back to prison again. He had moved to Colorado Springs to attend the Nazarene Bible College. He attended classes there until 1978. At that point, he was asked to withdraw early because of his alleged misconduct. While in Colorado, James had moved from job to job. He started as a janitor at the Citadel Mall. 
then moved on to work on the assembly line at Ampex Corporation. He got fired from that job and went to work on the docks of Walter Drake & Sons, Inc. He then got fired from there, and that's when he had started working as a maintenance man at the apartment complex that Yvonne and Benjamin lived at. While in Colorado, James had received at least one citation for driving while under the influence. James had actually gotten married, but that marriage ended up in divorce as his ex-wife filed charges against him for third-degree assault, as they had had quite a tumultuous and violent relationship. She did, however, later drop those charges. With all this information in hand, as well as a search warrant, police proceeded to go to James Perry's house. His common-law wife, Victoria, answered the door, and she said that James was not home at the time. She, however, told the cops that they could come on in and look, and she would answer any questions they had. Not that she had much of a choice. She told them her husband had been working the day of the murders. But he had come home for lunch, and then gone back into work after that. Detectives also found out that James's wife was employed as a cleaner at the apartment complex, and she, along with the other cleaners, had a master key. However, when they asked her to retrieve it for them, it was missing. In the laundry room of the couple's home, detectives found bleach, as well as the clothes that the witness had said the man he had seen walking into the apartment had been wearing, the plaid shirt and the tan pants. They took the clothes for analysis at the crime lab, but they knew they probably weren't going to get anything, as bleach had probably destroyed any evidence there had been. The pen they had found at the scene that had blood and white splatter on it, they had determined to be white paint. Detectives wanted to compare the paint that James had used on his last paint job at the apartment complex to the paint that was found on the pen. Officers confiscated the paint cans from the maintenance building as evidence. James Perry was arrested and brought in for questioning. A few hours later, the police announced that he was in custody as a suspect their main suspect. James wasn't talking though, and he had asked for an attorney as soon as he got there. Police also noticed that when James was brought in, he was wearing a silver watch. This silver watch had a white substance on it, a white substance that looked very much like the paint they had found on the pen. Identical, actually. Once the paint was later tested, they determined that the paint on the pen matched the paint on his watch. During the afternoon of the murders, James had actually talked casually to a reporter who was there on the scene, and he acted shocked about the incidents. He told the reporter that he had met the Cisneros family shortly before Christmas when he had helped them jumpstart a friend's car. He said that the family had invited him back to their apartment for a beer afterwards, but he hadn't socialized with them since. Authorities believed that James Perry had taken the master key and quietly snuck into the Cisneros apartment and attacked. He then went home, bleached his clothes, and then went back to work. I'm guessing work didn't notice that he was gone. Nobody noticed that he wasn't, you know, there doing his job, I guess. James's trial was held in November of 1979, and it lasted a long 17 days. The prosecution had attempted to build a case against James based on circumstantial evidence, which was not a good thing, including hair, blood, and fiber that had been found at the scene. They even called up many scientific experts to testify. However, the defense had their own experts, and there was many conflicts in the scientific testimony. Even though one witness had said that he had seen James enter the Cisneros family apartment, and another one had later said that she saw James running away from the apartment complex with his hands dripping in blood, the defense challenged their credibility. The defense also said that James Perry had been spotted multiple times throughout the morning, looking normal and with no blood on his clothes. So that was a problem for them. He was there in the morning with no blood on his clothes. The attack happened. And then he went home and changed his clothes and came back with no blood on his clothes again. So he could have been seen multiple times, no problem, even in the morning multiple times. That doesn't mean he didn't do it. At the end of the 17 days, on November 24th, the jury deliberated and then gave their verdict. They found James Joseph Perry not guilty on all counts. Unbelievable. I don't know how, given what we know about the case, I don't know what they heard that made them think differently, but 
So after being incarcerated for the last 10 months, James was now a free man. When the reporters outside of the courthouse asked him what the first thing he was going to do now that he was out of jail, he said, don't ask me that, with a grin. The investigation of the Cisnero family murders didn't continue after this. The case went into the police files as unsolved. Police had no other leads, and all the evidence they had pointed directly to James. Authorities believed the case had been solved, but justice had not been served. After the trial, James Perry moved back to New York. Several months later, the lead investigator learned that James Joseph Perry had been thrown out of a 10th story window. And in the detective's words, he didn't fly so well. So I think that justice ended up being served in the end. A memorial service was held for Yvonne, Benjamin Jr. and Carlos on January 19th, 1979 at the St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church in Pueblo, Colorado. They were buried together side by side in the Roselawn Cemetery. The mother and two boys share a beautiful headstone that is placed at the head of their graves. Benjamin Cisnero Sr. says the pain has still never worn off. Well, thank you for listening to all of Yvonne, Benjamin, and Carlos's story today. It's very sad that the justice system failed this family. But whether it was karma, coincidence, or something else, at least justice was served in the end. James Perry ended up dying a painful death, just like he had put his poor, helpless victims through. So if you do like to watch true crime and you want to hear it from me, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button below and give this video a like if you feel like it. Thank you for watching A Wicked World. Until next time, take care guys. Bye.